I think I'd have to live 100 years, but when I grow up, I want to have a faith like Julie Kelnhofer's. I haven't been around her much, but man, does she make an impression. It's a beautiful faith, and she has been kind enough to be our guest on My Faith with Homer and Pip. It's a video cast about faith that we hope and pray will help you on your journey to and through the cross of Christ with Steve the Homer too. Again, he got together with the Holy Spirit for this idea, and our incomparable producer, Brent Yunk. I'm Tommy Pippins, and without further ado, Julie always homer kicks it off so take it away buddy after a great intro which always makes me think come on let's go julie let's go let's go where do you want to start it's my faith your story take it away from whatever spot you think is appropriate all right well thank you so much for having me i have never done any of this before so i'm very excited for my story um usually when people ask me about my faith, I give the same testimony story, talking about my faith growing up and um, in college, but I don't think that's quite the story the Holy Spirit wants me to tell. So this is a new one first time. So, um, it really started last summer. I worked at a summer camp called Camp Fotiwa. It's an adventure, uh, adventure summer camp based off of the teachings of St. John Paul II. So I did all kinds of activities with the campers, whitewater rafting, hiking, rock climbing, and we would connect each of those activities back to Christian life. Um, so very beautiful camp. Um, it was in the very last week that I was there, we had high school boy campers there, and I was sitting praying in the chapel, and it was raining a little bit, and I just had this discontent feeling, and I was staring at one of the windows in the chapel, and hundreds of raindrops hitting this window. It's like, Lord, I feel like that is my heart. I feel like there's some kind of wall or something that's blocked off to you. And there are all these ways that are trying to enter into my heart, but I'm just not letting you. I don't know what it is. And for a long time, I had always felt like I was at the tip of the iceberg of knowing Jesus. Like I was just dipping my toes into his love and his mercy, but there's so much to him I didn't know. So I had this very restless feeling of, well, what is it doing wrong? What else can I do to draw near to you, Lord? Um, so that I went to mass and the gospel reading was about um, Thomas, where he needs to stick his fingers into Jesus' side to believe. And the priest gave a beautiful homily about how it's not physically seeing Jesus that makes us believe. Um, that he calls each of us by name. So I was sitting with that. I was like, okay, Lord, there, there's something going on here. I don't know what this is, but in prayer, this related to the homily. What am I lacking? What should I do? And the entire rest of the week with the campus, I just had a very restless feeling. And I remember walking down one of the trails and saying, Lord, I'm so restless and I don't know what to do. And if you keep here for the rest of my life, okay. But I am in agony. I don't know what to do. And I came to find that I was really afraid to knock on Jesus' door. I was afraid that if I truly sought him out, that there would be nobody there. I was lacking so much in faith and belief. I mean, I believed in God. I prayed every day and I went to mass, but just the faith was really lacking. And so I wanted to talk with the priest who was there that week um, about just everything that was going on in prayer. Um, and it was the final mass and I still wasn't able to talk to him yet. Mass had just ended and he was about to leave. And I, I had the thought of, hmm, I should ask for a divine appointment with him. So I was like, okay, Lord, please, please, please give me a divine appointment with Father Ryan. And five minutes later, Father Ryan comes up to me and he says, we never got to talk yet. I'm leaving the mountain in two hours. You still want to talk. I'm free right now. It's like, okay, that'd be great. Thank you. <laughs> so um, I started to talk about just everything that's going on in prayer. And honestly, I don't remember how all of our conversation went. But at some point, he was just asking me questions about my life and particularly my life with Jesus. And um, at one point, I mentioned a wound, a memory from high school, something that I'd gone through. Um, it was something I kind of blocked out, but I just randomly brought this up really by the Holy Spirit. And he was like, oh, 
I'm so sorry about Julie, that. Do you want to talk Julie, more? you stop for just a second, only because I want to make sure, kind of like, it just seems, everything seems off a little bit to me, and I don't want to do this and then it not be able to use. Um, it's so good. May I ask this, if, Julie, I do it on my phone, and of course, when you get spam calls or whatever all else, but, but you think it might help to do it on, on the phone? I have internet issues and uh, did a Chromebook thing, and finally, I've gone to this phone. Do you, you think that might work a little bit better? Is it I mean, worth it? I don't know if Brett has that, anything. Was everything off a little bit, or was it just me? I don't, I mean, I'm, it, it's so good, and yet there's just a little bit of, yes, you're right. Yeah, it wasn't oh. quite right, so... I mean, we could have worked yes. with it, but if yeah, if just you want kind of on the phone, well, let's do that. Yes, I'll try it on my phone. Okay. Let's see if that works any better. Because you're off to oh, a I'm roar. so sorry for the wet. Oh, actually, no, we've we've done it before. Believe us. What'd you say? I, I do it now on my iPhone, and and it seems like it works so much better all the time. I don't. I, Brent would know if. Nope. Seems better. Julie's here. All right. I'm going to leave the meeting on my computer and try it on my phone and see if that works. All right. Awesome. Wonderful. Okay. Let's see. Can you all hear me okay? Yes, we can. This actually okay. look, already looks a lot better. So Okay. It's better than the okay, we'll stick with this. Um is where I, I was going with my story okay? I, how is there a certain time amount I should keep Just it kept your at? Story, as long as it takes to be, to to get it out is perfect. Yeah. Okay. As Homer and Brent have uh, have taught me here there are no rules. We just roll. Now to you, Brent, is it easier to start over and make it clean? Um, you know, we don't have to. We can we can just roll like this. Homer, what do you think? I, I would start from the beginning. Okay. Yeah, clean in that, and it might end up being easier for you too. Okay. Okay, Julie. That sounds good. This is beautiful. What you're sharing. This is awesome. <laughs> All right, I'm going to mute again and Pip, take her away. Yes, sir. Thank you. When I grow up and I'd have to live about 100 years, I want to be like Julie Kaunhofer because she has a faith that just blew me away. And we only talked for a few minutes. And Julie has been kind enough to join us as a guest on My Faith with Homer and Pip. It's a video podcast we hope and pray will help you on your journey to and through the cross of Christ. Steve the Homer too and the Holy Spirit had the idea. I'm Tommy Pippins. More importantly, we have our wonderful guest, Julie. We have our producer, Brent Young, and Steve the Homer True. He always kicks it off, Julie. So Homer, take it away. Julie, I'm always curious where people choose to start their story. I'm guessing you have a number of options. So where are you going to start? Thank you so much for having me on this podcast. I have never done anything like this before, so I'm very excited for the opportunity to share my story. Um, usually when people ask me about my faith journey, I always tell the same story of my faith life growing up and in college, but as I was praying yesterday in adoration, there is a little bit different story that I think the Holy Spirit wants to tell me, so here goes nothing. Um, my story really starts last summer when I served at a camp called Camp Wetiwa. It's located in Boulder, Colorado. Um, and this camp is all about uh, rock climbing, whitewater rafting, hiking, doing these fun camp activities, but then relating it back to the Christian life. Um, and very big on the teachings of St. John Paul II as it's called Camp Wetiwa. So there was one day uh, it was the very last week that I was working at this camp with high school boys. There was one day I was sitting in the chapel and I was staring at one of the windows and it was raining a little bit. And as I was watching the rain hit the window, I just felt like there was a wall between myself and Christ. There was something in me that wasn't fully letting him in. As I looked at this window, I was like, oh, all of those raindrops are the ways that Christ, you were trying to enter my heart, but there's this wall up and I can't figure out what it is. 
and I'd felt kind of numb to him. So I, I prayed more about this and I don't, for a long time, I'd felt like I was on the tip of the iceberg of knowing Jesus. Um, there's so much to his endless love and mercy that I didn't know. And I, I wanted to dive in, but I didn't know how. So after I finished praying, I went to mass with the counselors and campers and the gospel reading for that day was about how Thomas needed to stick his fingers into Jesus's side to really believe. And the priest, their father, Ryan, he gave a beautiful homily about how we do not believe because we literally see Jesus. I mean, he isn't walking this earth anymore. We believe because he calls us each by name. That is what increases our faith. I was like, okay, Lord, this relates back to what was going on in prayers. There's something here. Um, as I continued on that week, I had the same restless feeling of wanting to dive deeper and wanting to just know Christ in a more intimate way, but I didn't know how. I didn't know what was wrong. I didn't know what the numbness in my heart was. And I said to the Lord, Lord, I'm so restless. I'm in agony. If you keep me here for the rest of my life, okay, but you, you have to do something, please. And I came to realize that I was really afraid to knock on Christ's door. Um, I was afraid that if I asked him to reveal himself to me in a tangible way that nothing would happen. He wouldn't be there. I mean, I believed in Jesus. I prayed and talked to him every single day and I went to mass on Sundays, but there was just something missing. It was really a lack of faith. But I, I took the step and I was like, Lord, please show yourself to me in a real intangible way. I want to know you. I want to love you so much deeper. I, I don't know how to, but I'm asking you, I'm knocking on your door, please answer. And so as the week went on, um, I tried talking to the priest, but he was very busy with the campers. Um, and finally, it was the very last mass. And I remembered, oh, Father Ryan, I really wanted to talk to him. So at the end of mass, it's like I felt prompted to ask for a divine appointment with him. So I prayed and I said, Lord, please bless me with a divine appointment with Father Ryan to talk about just everything that's been going on in prayer. And so right after mass had ended, um, five minutes later, after I had prayed this prayer, Father Ryan comes up to me. He's like, hey, Julie, um, I remember you wanted to talk with me and we never quite got to, I have time right now. I'm about to leave the mountain in two hours. So if you want to talk, let's talk. I was like, okay, great. <laughs> and so um, we just talked about everything that was going on in prayer in my heart. Um, and then he started asking me questions. And I don't remember quite how the conversation went, but at some point I had mentioned a wound, a memory from when I was in high school. And um, it was something that I'd really blocked out. And he paused for a second. He was like, Julie, I'm so sorry you had to go through that. I'm gonna talk about it more. And so we did. And then he asked to pray with me and he walked me through that memory. But this time I saw Christ there with me. I, um, in the memory, it was in that woundedness that Christ met me. And he didn't want me to suffer what I'd suffered, but he, I saw how he was loving me in that moment so dearly. And that was the first time in my entire life that I had truly been aware and had felt Jesus's presence. And so that was a huge, huge turning point. Um, and after that, I bawled my eyes out and I realized that I had been the one trying to pursue the Lord, you know, spending time with him in prayer and going to mass, but I didn't let him pursue me. I wasn't letting him go after my heart. I wasn't being vulnerable with him. I'd always just plastered on a smile and said, I'm good, everything's fine. Here are my prayer intentions. This is what I wanna to talk to you about today. But I'd never really let him into the woundedness, into my wounds. Um, and it was there where he met me that he totally transformed me and renewed me and met me there. And so after that, um, I prayed a very dangerous prayer that radically changed my life. I prayed that I would be addicted to Jesus in the Eucharist. And since praying that prayer, coming back from camp, I started going to daily mass almost every single day in adoration. And that had such a radical change on my life. Um, I'd always wanted to go to daily mass prior, 
and I, I more so went because I felt like I needed to and I almost would feel guilty if I didn't go but now it was because I truly wanted to be with Jesus um, and so the more that I met him in the Eucharist the more that my faith started to increase the second radical prayer that I prayed that has also impacted my faith journey was to have eyes of faith, Mary's eyes of faith specifically, to see the world through Mary's eyes. And since praying that, um, this was during Holy Week, I got rid of all social media and stopped listening to the noise of the world. And instead, which was really the noise of my car that I used um, music and the radio to just tune everything out. I had so much silence in my life and I was finally able to really hear the voice of the Holy Spirit and what he was asking me to do and prompting me to do. Um, and so there was this one moment on Holy Thursday where I was going on this um, altar of repose kind of field trip with other Catholics in the Milwaukee area. And there's this Protestant friend that I had that I invited to come with me, but he didn't text back for a while. And then eventually I was getting on the bus to start this journey to visit these different altars around Milwaukee of repose. And I remembered right as the bus is about to leave, I was like, oh my gosh, my friend, he, I don't know if he still wanted to come with. So I checked my phone and he was like, yeah, I'd love to meet up with you. Where should I meet? Right as the bus was leaving, I was like, oh no, Lord, what have I done? <laughs> and so I texted him and I said, can you please meet us at the first church? And no response. It's like, okay, actually meet us at the second church. There were, um, I believe seven we went to total. Finally, he responded. And then I was like, oh, before he responded, I was like, Lord, I messed this up. You, you wanted to see him. And I totally forgot. What are you, how am I supposed to work with this? And then this voice came to me that said, ye of little faith, do you not trust in me? Like you've been praying for Mary's eyes of faith. That means that things might not go as you see fit. They might not pan out how you think they will, but have faith that even if you make a mistake, it's still going to go according to my will. You don't need to see the fruits for them to be there. And so eventually my friend was able to meet up with us for the rest of the altar of repose, which was so, so beautiful. And that was just an example, a very tangible example of how Christ was really increasing my faith um, especially through the Eucharist and through his mother, Mary. Um, I, I always say those two things, the Eucharist and Mary are the highway to heaven. And when I started to pray the rosary more regularly and see Jesus in the Eucharist and adoration in mass, that is when my faith life went like this. And I am still on the journey and still excited to see where he's taking me. Um, and that's, that's my journey so far. In your life, what would you say to someone has changed the most since those two things have been added to your faith? Mm -hmm. what, what's at the top of the list of change that you've noticed the most? Mm -hmm. I would say a peace and a trust within myself. Um, just so much more peace for everything going on around me. I used to be a lot more worried about the small things in life, but since um, really growing closer to Jesus in the Eucharist and Mary, his mother, I just had this peace that he is taking care of everything in my life. Um, and definitely faith. I didn't even really know what faith was um, prior to last summer, but I've seen such an increase in faith in my life. Um, and just the Lord asking me to do more and I've been able to listen to him and have the faith to act on those things and not just say, oh, what if it's just my brain or thoughts coming to me saying, you should do this, but the trust that, no, it actually is the Holy Spirit asking me to act in this way and having the faith that, yes, I'm going to do this because I know that is you, Holy Spirit, that is asking me to do this. I'm, I'm curious to know how great it is because Clearly, your faith was pretty strong. You're at this camp. Maybe you can tell us more about the camp or the input you have on people and uh, how you knew about the camp or what influenced you mm -hmm. on the camp. All those things tell me that the faith was pretty strong before this change. Mm -hmm. um, you wanted to know more about the camp, you said? 
Well, just how you got involved, why you wanted to do it, what was special about it, thinking and then being there, both of those parts. Mm -hmm. So uh, I had originally found out about this camp at a conference called Focus, I believe it was in 2019. It's a large um, Catholic conference for college students. And they had this large room set up and all of these booths and tables for different Catholic organizations and religious groups. And I came across one for Camp Fotiwa. And I had never felt such a strong tug in my heart, such a strong burn to do something before as I did when I discovered Camp Fotiwa. Um, I've always loved hiking and being outdoors and Colorado is such a beautiful state. So the fact that this camp was in Colorado and I got to do those things and it was a Catholic camp, that was so, so beautiful to me. And after I'd gone back to my hotel room that night, I started researching this Camp Watiwa that I had learned about. It's like, how do I do this? This is so great. And immediately I was struck with this fear and this sense of this lie really that you're not good enough to do this. Like this is such a selective camp. You would never be chosen for this. And I started to cry. I was like, Lord, I, I don't know what this voice is. I realized, oh, this is the enemy. He is making me feel afraid and he's telling me this lie that I can't do this because he doesn't want me to be there. I'm gonna apply to be there. So I applied and I got accepted my first summer. Um, the first summer I served was in 2019. Um, and then this past summer, 2021, I'd served there again. And I'm actually gonna be leaving for my third summer at Camp Potiwa on June 10th. Um, so this, this camp is so beautiful and that it calls about radical self gift. Um, there are so many unique parts of camp, unique things that we do that we're called and asked to do, like um, making, feeding 50 high school boys, waking up at 4.30 or five in the morning to make a huge meal of pancakes and bacon for them, or having to dump out um, dishwashing buckets, having to fill up the dishwashing buckets. Um, it's a very nitty gritty outdoorsy camp. There's no buildings. We sleep in hammocks for the whole summer. Um, so it's very outdoorsy. And it was really at that camp that I discovered um, who Christ is and where he meets us is really in our woundedness and in the mess of our own lives that he's there. Does that answer your question? Uh, everything answers my question. And the more you talk, the more I realize that your faith has consumed your life. It's every word you say is in relative to that in some degree. When did that start? When did your faith become this important mm -hmm. as you've explored figuring out or changing it? Um, mm -hmm. You know, that is a good question, and I'm not sure if I have a very clear answer to it. Um, I grew up in a Catholic family. My family always went to Mass on Sundays. Um, my grandparents were very into the faith, um, but it was something that was very hidden. And it wasn't until I got to college that I learned that we were each called to have a personal relationship with Christ. Um, I attended this uh, organization called Crew uh, Campus Crusades for Christ. And that was where I first heard that. And I wanted that. I wanted a personal relationship with Jesus, um, but I didn't know how to go about it. And this organization is mostly um, non-denominational, but every anyone of any denomination is really welcome. So I found a very good Christian community there. Um, but there was someone who had found out that I was Catholic and they started saying these things against this, against the Catholic faith. And I was so terrified because it's like, they just found out that it was Catholic and they're going at my faith. And what if everyone else finds out that I'm Catholic? Are they going to hate me too? And so I really started to question, well, why am I Catholic? I don't just want to be Catholic because that's the way that I was raised. I want to be Catholic because it is the one true church. I'm I was searching for the one true church. And so I had done all kinds of research. I prayed a lot about of it. And then eventually I read this book called Rome Sweet Home by Scott Hahn. And just everything that Scott Hahn had talked about in his own personal conversion story rang true with me. And I had so much peace with the Catholic church. So to answer your question, I'd say it's really, um, 
the Catholic Church, specifically the sacraments, I'm convinced, um, that have gotten me to where I am in my faith today. I will defer to Tommy in a second, but I always ask everyone the same question. When do you feel closest in your relationship to God, Jesus? I feel closest to Jesus when I am a few feet away from him in an adoration chapel. Or when right after communion, that's probably an even better answer, but whenever I am in close relation to Jesus in the Eucharist. Because? It's Jesus in the Eucharist. It's truly him, body, blood, soul, and divinity. It's Jesus. It's the one whom I love, and I, I just love to be near to him. Tommy, your turn. Oh, such a, a simple but yet profound faith, Julie. I mean, the gift of, of experience Jesus the way that you have. And uh, the, the whole idea of just knowing in your heart and soul that he is present in the Eucharist. When you and I talk, you just mentioned in your humble manner, yeah, I was at adoration for three hours. Three hours in adoration. How do you do that? So maybe you can just speak to how you, maybe that's just the gift that you've been given of great faith. I'm, I'm thinking as I listen to you, you're a cross between St. Mother Teresa and uh, St. Faustina, for goodness sake. <laughs> um, it's not something that I regularly do. Um, when I was growing more in my Catholic faith, I um, joined my school's uh, Catholic group here. Um, I, I was told about a holy hour, spending an hour with the Lord. And I was like, okay, if this is something I wanna do, how do I go about doing that? And how I had been taught, it was, kind of a structured thing of you can say certain prayers and pray a rosary and do a spiritual reading. But the Lord was really, I had found he was asked me not to spend just an hour with him, but to turn off my phone, not look at the clock, just spend as much time with him as he wanted me to. So I stopped praying a holy hour and would just go to the adoration chapel. And I just had this feeling of, okay, I know when you want me to leave, Lord, not that he ever wants anyone to leave, but we need to, um, just a feeling of, okay, I'm ready to go. And it's funny that you mentioned that because he did the same thing again. Um, yesterday, I was in the chapel for four hours and I really, this is not a normal occurrence for me. Usually I go for, it usually ends up being an hour or so, but I was there for four hours and it felt like 20 minutes. Time just flies by when I'm with Jesus. Um, Something that I used to wonder was, oh, I can't even spend 20 minutes in prayer with him. How am I supposed to spend the rest of eternity with Jesus when I can't even sit here for him with 20 minutes in 20 minutes? Um, but he, I don't know what it is. It's a special grace, maybe. I, I just love spending time in adoration with him. And what happens there, Julie? Do you are you able, as you said earlier, to block out all the noise? Do you mind sharing? I know it's intimate. What goes on? He speaks, you mm -hmm. listen. You listen, mm -hmm. he's vice versa, whatever I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny you say block with the noise because today I was in adoration and there was a parade going on right outside and I was somehow able to block it out. <laughs> um, I mean, it really looks different every time. Sometimes when I go right after school, I'm a fourth grade Catholic school teacher. Sometimes my brain is just so dead and I can't come up with a single thought. So I just sit there. Sometimes I fall asleep. Um, oftentimes I'll usually journal, I actually have it right here with me, um, I'll feel prompted to just start journaling and I, it's me writing, but I don't know exactly what I'm writing half the time. It's like me praying and I feel like it's the Holy Spirit that's guiding my hand to write down what I write and through journaling so many of my questions have been answered. He's been teaching me so many things. Um, so journaling is definitely a big thing. Um, imaginative prayer, um, just going to a place. I imagine this garden area where I just sit with Jesus and talk with him, or I'm just next to him. Um, spiritual readings, I started to read Story of a Soul, um, the autobiography of St. Therese Blissou, pray rosaries. It's really different every time. 
Wow. Well, you brought something up that I'd like to have you embellish on, if you would, please. And that's the Holy Spirit. There's been a lot going on recently in the, you know, in the Catholic readings as we talk here on Memorial Day. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you, he's kind of on the sidelines, it seems like, at least in many lives, including my own. Now it's, hey, he's the paraclete. He's the one the Father and the Son left. Would you talk mm -hmm. about the Holy Spirit, Julie, and his impact on your life and on your faith? Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. Um, everything flows from the Holy Spirit. Um, do, you, do you mind if I read you something that I journaled yesterday? You wanted to, I was hoping you might share a little bit if we weren't being too. <laughs> oh, sure. I'm happy to. Um, so when I journal, it's me writing to Jesus. So this was about um, actually the two radical prayers that I just mentioned with both of you. So I'll just read what I wrote. If that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, Perfect. Um, so I started to write, why do I believe in the Eucharist? Why do I believe that you have made yourself presence, body, blood, soul, and divinity in a small piece of bread? It says in the Bible, you say five times that the bread from heaven is truly your flesh. And there are so many teachings about it that I've listened to, and they all check out. They all make sense. But I believe that you are truly present in the Eucharist, body, blood, soul, and divinity because of personal encounter. Last summer, I prayed that I would be addicted to you in the Eucharist and addicted to you in the Eucharist, I became. I started going to daily mass and I was drawn to pray in your presence in holy adoration. Lord, I know that I could pray anywhere, but why would I spend my intentional prayer time, time that is meant to draw near to you, my dad, just anywhere when I could spiritually and literally draw near to you in adoration? I'm convinced that the holiest towns, holiest churches, holiest parishioners can be found where you make yourself present perpetually in an adoration chapel, if not through the offering of daily mass. When I have seen the greatest increase in my faith life, when I have been the most closely aligned with you, Lord, has been when I have, was consist consistently with you, if not near you, in the Eucharist. If the unclean woman was made clean for merely touching your garments in the Bible, um, how much more so are we made new? Are we given new life? Are we conformed to you when we consume you in Holy Communion? But abundant graces are poured out to those that have eyes of faith to truly see you and to be addicted to you in the Eucharist. That is but one of the most dangerous radical prayers I've prayed. To have Mary's eyes of faith to see the world through her eyes. That is the second. When I started to see you with Mary's eyes of faith is when things really began to change. I tuned out the noises of the world, specifically the noise of my car radio, and tuned into the station of the Holy Spirit. Your mother helped and is helping me to be more aware of the presence of the Holy Spirit in his promptings. With her eyes of faith, I've been able to follow him, to do particular things for a reason. It is with her faith that when I act according to the promptings of the Holy Spirit, do not immediately or even at all see the fruits of my work. I know that they are still there. They do not depend on my own eyes to exist. They exist, and I know this, because uh, Mary has given me her own eyes of faith to see this. And how fitting is it that Mary and her spouse, the Holy Spirit, work together in this way? It is with Mary's eyes of faith in the movement of the Holy Spirit that great things can be done for the kingdom of God. And I am a witness to this. Mm. Such, I know Homer's got questions, so I'm, I'm eager to get back. I've got a couple more. Uh, such peace, such joy. Is it always like this for you? Do you ever get anxious? Do you ever get off kilter? And then where do you go from there? I mean, I know you go to Jesus, but but does that, does that happen to you? Or do you just always have a smile? And, and <laughs> you can see exuding from you. Um, well, Two weeks ago, um, two weeks ago, I was not able to go to daily mass and adoration. I think I meant went maybe once and obviously Sunday mass. Um, and I, I just didn't feel myself. I was so lonely and I felt so far from Christ. And I started to worry about things more. And I connected with, oh, I have not been to daily mass. I have not been to adoration in a while. I truly am becoming addicted to Jesus in the Eucharist. Um, so it's when I am away from him in the Eucharist that 
worries and things of this world start to bother me more and tempt me more. Um, and that's why I think it's so important to always be near, near to Jesus in the Eucharist. I'm, I'm a human, so I definitely worry about things and have fears just like anyone else. But I, all I can do is just trust in Jesus and follow what he's asking me to do and love him. That's all anyone can do. Yeah, that's an example, I think, for all of us within the sound of your voice. And that is instead of running away from whether it's falling short, sinning, whatever it may be, it speak to myself, not to you, but you run toward, as Peter did, toward rather than you know, we'd, we'd have Judas Iscariot. A um, couple other things, if memory serves. You were considering becoming a nun. Now, in time, you're hoping and praying that the Lord brings you a, a good Christian Catholic man. <laughs> Talk <laughs> about that. You got to... <laughs> Um, yes, my friend had asked me if I would go on a religious discernment retreat with her. And I, something I've been saying more is, you know, why the heck not? What harm can come from this? So I went and being with the sisters was so, so beautiful. I don't even know <laughs> the name of the order. I know they're in Joliet, Illinois, but I don't even know the name of the order. So that's not very good. Um, but just being with them, there was so much peace enjoy in each of the sisters um, is such a beautiful witness to religious life and I definitely grew in appreciation of and love for religious sisters but it wasn't something that I had felt a particular call to um, and I talked with one of the sisters about it and she's like mm, you know everything you're saying I think married life is the way to go for you it's like okay and um, I had a beautiful prayer time after that in adoration and then it was Sunday, the day when I was going to leave. Um, I think every, all, everyone that was on this discernment retreat was supposed to leave at two o'clock, but I woke up and I was like, Lord, I want to go home. I want to leave right now. And I talked with the sister and she's like, oh yes, it's normal. It's okay to leave now. Um, and so I left and maybe the Lord is still calling me to religious life, but he hasn't yet. Um, so far, he has really been showing me the beauty of Catholic family life, I think is just so, so beautiful to see um, married people that are Catholic that really live out of the sacramental life. Um, but I don't know, that could change. I am just taking it one step at a time. <laughs> Absolutely, it's a good way to go and celebrating the moments. Now really taking a step out in faith, right? Because you're leaving this wonderful profession as a Catholic school teacher and you've got a raise me and the please chat about that and and how that all is part of your faith journey and literally again stepping out in faith and trusting in Jesus mm. um so going back to that focus conference I had talked about when I first heard about Camp with Tiwa that's also when I learned about Christ in the city those are the only two organizations that I remember and coming across the booth for Christ in the City, there was one of the missionaries who um, was wearing kind of rundown clothes and they were holding up a sign that said homeless. And uh, I was so blown away because I'd always had a heart and a love for the homeless. Um, and here there was a Catholic mission group that was, um, their whole mission was to get to know the homeless and encounter them in a very radical way and to bring Jesus's love to them. And that was so appealing to me. And I was like, Lord, I want to do this, but I don't know where in my plans it's going to fit in. So if you want me to do this, okay, but I don't know how, how this is going to fit into my life. And so I finished college and I graduated. And um, last spring, I was praying about Christ in the city. I was also offered this teaching position. And I just had so much restlessness with Christ in the city. It wasn't the right time. So I accepted, accepted this teaching, teaching position. And um, it's been such a beautiful year teaching uh, fourth grade. I, I truly love the profession so much. But I was reminded of that call to Christ in the city. And the Lord just started opening up doors. He um, just made it possible in a very, very real way for me to actually do this mission. It became very clear to me that he wanted me to do this. Um, when I left for the interview weekend, I had peace from the moment that I stepped into the O'Hare Chicago airport 
all the way until I returned back home. Even during the interview, I wasn't nervous at all. I had so much peace the entire weekend. And I've just trusted from there that, Lord, you are giving me this peace. And so far you are opening all these doors. So all I can do is walk through them with you. There a, again, step out in faith. Don't you have to raise a hunk of money like about 10 grand or so? And how is that coming together? And how is your faith? looking in the midst of all of that. Mm -hmm. um, yes, so each missionary is asked to fundraise $10,000. So that covers the cost of um, housing, retreats, food, everything that the missionary really needs for the entire year of service. Um, it actually costs $30,000 per missionary, but they fundraise the other two thirds of that for each of the missionaries, which is very kind and generous of them. So we only have to fundraise $10,000. Um, it's been going, it's been going okay so far. Um, there have been so many names that the Holy Spirit has brought up for me to reach out to. And at first I was very afraid of asking people for money. Um, but he is showing me that asking others for things is really a way to bring them into this mission. I mean, we're called to give of our time, talent, and treasure. He has allowed me to give my time for this mission. Not everyone has a year that they can give up their lives for this. Um, so they can give of their treasure um, by supporting the each of the missionaries. They're really entering into this mission and going on the mission with the missionaries. That was a lot of the word mission in one. <laughs> um, so it really is a beautiful way to trust in the Lord. And he has shown me his faithfulness, and just how good it is to ask things of him and to ask things of other people when it is for the kingdom, for the kingdom's work. All right, Homer. Come on, buddy. I don't know how many times you've said it. It became very clear to me. I like to do a t-shirt. I think that would be your t-shirt. Huh? Explain that. It didn't just become clear. It became very clear to me. And then the next time, and it became very clear to me. I want to know more. What's very clear to me? <laughs> um oh <laughs> the holy spirit is all i can say um really just learning how to discern and how to discern well um bringing things to jesus in prayer um when i ask things of him and i bring things to him Either I met with a great peace and joy, and I know that it's what the Lord is asking me to do, or there's anxiousness, discomfort, restlessness, um, like I felt last spring with Christ in the city. I, I knew that I wasn't called to do it then because I felt such great restlessness. I didn't have peace with it. But this time around, I had so much peace, and I'm so thankful for the restlessness that I felt because it allowed me to recognize and know what true peace is from Jesus. What's your dream? What is my dream? Hmm. Um, <laughs> that is a good question. What is my dream? My dream is that. Two, and both of them were answered. <laughs> what was that? I said, I know you had two and you started with the two of them were answered. In terms the of. Two of them were answered. And then Mary. Yes. I don't know if. If you're you're okay for a while or <laughs> um my dream is as of right now is to fundraise um ten thousand dollars in the next two weeks before i leave for camp Otiwa, um on june 10th but we will see how the lord decides to work with that one um a more real dream is that every christian and every person on the face of this earth will come to know Jesus in the real presence of the Eucharist and will have a love for Mary. Um, I think the enemy really tears Christians apart, especially like different denominations um, by like our teachings. You know, he, there's so many people that think that the Catholic faith is something that it's really not. It's all that I want is for people to know that Catholics, any Christian, the root of it is love and the root of it is the heart of Jesus. They're, Christians get so much flack, and um, I feel like people see Christians who 
and maybe you don't live the best lifestyle and then I just say oh well that's what Christians are about I don't want to be part of that but it's really my dream for people to see Christianity at its truth at its core and to say I want that for myself how do I go about doing that the Eucharist and Mary are the two best ways um but just for everyone to know what Christ church is really about is love Back to you, Tommy. Don't think we need to embellish this, Julie. And I'm so sorry for what you, you went through. But I, I'm thinking God is so great that that appointment with Father Ryan that you call a divine appointment, you probably never expected to, to mention that you went through a difficult situation and you prayed together and probably you're on this journey to healing in that regard. Again, I just mm -hmm. want from the standpoint of how neat is it that his love is so great for you that he said, I'm going to give you a bonus here. We've got a lot going on in this meeting with the priest. Mm -hmm. um, yes, that was very unexpected. I, yeah, I didn't know that was going to happen, but I'm so thankful for it. I mean, it really, I believe, is a testament to how Christ wants to meet each of us in our woundedness. Um, you know, people ask, well, why does... God allow bad things to happen in our world. There are so many answers you could give, but the one thing I always like to turn to is, well, look at how he can take this brokenness and this woundedness and transform it into good. I mean, look at how he took this memory, this woundedness, this wound I'd gone through, and he used it to bring me closer to his heart. I think just always pointing things back to Christ is the most important thing we can do is... Yeah, just seeing the brokenness, the moodiness, and saying, okay, this is awful, but Christ has a plan for this, and he's going to use this for good. Beautiful. Anything else, Homer? No. No. Uh, I want, because there's no way anybody's going to watch this once. Uh, I guess I would ask, when you, have you met anybody like you? I mean, I, do you, or, or when you talk about this, how do you feel and notice in other people? Mm -hmm. Because I don't think I'm going out on a limb to say, not everybody's exactly like you. Mm -hmm. um, I have the counselors that I've worked with at Camp Fotiwa. Um, they are so, so good and strong in their faith. Um, there are two girls, especially that I've grown very close to, which I wasn't, I didn't see that happening, but they are truly friends sent from heaven. Their names are Isabel and Maria, and we keep in touch weekly. Um, those two, I am so, so thankful for them because they opened up to me about their vulnerabilities and their prayer lives and what was going on um, in their hearts with Jesus and allowed me to then to talk about my life with Jesus. Um, talking about Christ was something that I wasn't very used to. I didn't grow up doing that, but they were just so free to share their hearts with me and be vulnerable that they, that I was received so well by each of them. And they allowed me to be vulnerable with them and with Jesus too. I've, I've just learned so much for them and I'm so thankful for them. But what's the date again you need the 10,000 by? June 10th. <laughs> Okay. Um, really, if uh, missionaries have until, I should check the date, I believe it's July 15th, um, but since I'm leaving for Camp Fotiwa, I am hoping to be fundraised by June 10th, but we will see what the Lord does with that. Tommy? Well, I'm hoping and praying that somebody wants to write that check and maybe when Brent gets posted, you know, Jesus is going to work in some way and you will have faith no, no matter what. Julie Kalnhofer, mm -hmm. we can't thank you enough for the gift of you spending your time and sharing your faith journey with us on My Faith with Homer and Pippin. It's been such a blessing. And as, as Homer said, people will watch multiple times and that's that's our prayer, that, that it will help others along their way. Thank you. You and the Holy Spirit did indeed knock it out of the park. Well, thank you again so much for having me and for your intentionality and listening and all of your questions. You, you two have very good questions. So thank you so much for having me and listening.
God bless you and yours, and we'll pray for those intentions. Uh, for the great Steve the Homer True and our marvelous producer, Brent Young, I'm Tommy Pippins. My faith with Homer and Pip, we truly hope that you have found it a blessing, and, and I trust that we're all very thankful and maybe better from a spiritual perspective after having spent time with Julie Kelmhofer. God bless you, everyone. Until next time.